Is this the most powerful image in all of sport? It's certainly the most iconic image in boxing. The greatest of the greatest. May 25, 1965. Muhammad Ali glares down menacingly at the vanquished Sonny Liston, daring him to get up. But Liston either couldn't or wouldn't. Already an Olympic champion and the most dynamic young pro the sport had seen, this flashpoint of sporting history didn't start Ali's legend, but it certainly confirmed it. In defeating Liston two minutes into the first round of his first title defense, Ali proved he was much more than a big mouth. Though a big mouth, he certainly was. But before we get too far into Ali's role, the story of the two fights between these giants of boxing really starts with their predecessor. Floyd Patterson put down Archie Moore in five rounds in 1956 to become, at 21, the then youngest heavyweight champ. He was also the first Olympic champion to win a world title, having taken the middleweight gold medal in Helsinki 1952. And with his placid nature, he became known as the Gentleman of Boxing. But in the ring, Patterson was a force. He defended his title four times inside the distance, and even after Swede Ingmar Johansson stopped him in June 1959, he knocked out Johansson in the rematch and again in a third fight. To become the first man to win back the heavyweight crown, he looked a class above everyone. Until Sonny Liston crushed him. Sonny Liston was Godzilla. He was unbeatable. He was going to reign for a thousand years. Uh, he was Mike Tyson before there was Mike Tyson. Liston was an ex-convict. He'd spent five years in jail for armed robbery and beating up a cop. He was managed by the mob. Born sometime between 1929 and 1932, Liston was the second youngest of his abusive and alcoholic father's 25 children. He didn't even know his own birthday. He worked as a leg breaker for the mob. He did time for beating a policeman senseless. He was arrested over 20 times. Liston was everything Floyd Patterson wasn't, and he made Iron Mike look like a pussycat. The Big Bear's method was simple. Push forward, swing those gigantic fists, and watch men fall. By 1962, he'd floored so many victims that Patterson had no choice but to fight him. And Liston knocked the smaller champion clean out in the first round. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately for Patterson, the contract demanded a rematch, and everyone had a prediction for how the second fight would go. Everyone, including another young Olympic prodigy like Patterson, by the name of Cassius Clay. The upcoming Liston Patterson rematch. Do you have a prediction on that? Well, I predict that Sonny Liston will win the fight in about three rounds. He'll stay the champion until he meet me. Cassius Clay's first big prediction came true. In 1963, Sonny Liston put Floyd Patterson away in the rematch of Liston's title victory the year before. Again, it was in the first round. With two first round knockouts of Patterson, Liston was considered the scariest man to ever lace up a glove. But he didn't want to give Clay a shot at the title because he simply didn't like him. The media had dubbed Clay the Louisville Lip because he was so cocky and arrogant. They loved his quirky poems predicting the round that he'd finish opponents in. He was so good, he'd deliver on those predictions. And Clay wanted Liston. Yes, I have a little sharp one for Sonny Liston, but I reveal all of it when the fight comes up. It goes something like this. If you like to lose your money, then be a fool and bet on Sonny. But if you want to have a good day, then put it on Clay. 
But instead of answering the challenge, Liston headed to London for several exhibition sparring sessions. Who do you expect your next real fight to be with? Haven't I been having real ones? Oh. I mean, aside from, ex uh, <laughs> aside from exhibition fights. Well, I expected, I hope it to be with Joe Hannison. But he's retired, hasn't he? Well, from what my manager told me, he hasn't. Well, a million and a half dollars would make anybody come out. I know I would. What about Brian London of this country? Brian London, I'd be glad to, to fight him and Joe Hennison same night. And Cassius Clay? <laughs> Gee, throw him in, too. <laughs> Cassius Clay attributes the delay in your meeting him to the fact that you're scared. Well, I am scared. Scared him or kill him. <laughs> when Liston wouldn't agree to fight, Clay went after him. Literally. He followed him around town, chased him into nightclubs, and hounded him in casinos until the big bear had had enough. It was time to teach the kid a lesson, and the sporting press expected a massacre. The odds were seven to one, which were prohibitive. Um, and Liston knocked everybody out in the first round. And, and these were my instructions. As soon as I got to Miami, rent a car, drive back and forth between the arena where the fight was going to be held and the nearest hospital so that I wouldn't waste any deadline time following Cassius Clay into intensive care. I mean, that's what they thought about the fight. Liston wasn't as tall as Clay, but he had an astonishing reach for his height, 15 centimeters greater, and he'd finished 25 of his fights before the final bell. That's more wins by knockout than the 22-year-old Clay had fights in total. But if Clay was scared, he wasn't showing it. Cassius Clay was a good, talented young fighter, but most members of the sporting media didn't give him a chance. I believe out of 41 reporters at ringside for that fight, and in those days you had far fewer reporters at ringside, only three picked Cassius Clay to win. The day came, February 25, 1964, and Clay was incredible. Liston couldn't get a gauge on the challenger's size and speed, and at the end of round six, just as Clay predicted, Liston quit on the stool, prompting the new champ to utter his now iconic phrase. I still got the wall! I still got the wall! I still got the wall! Clay had done the impossible, and after the fight, he let all the doubters know how wrong they were in no uncertain terms. Never make me no underdog, and never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. Not a heavyweight in the world fast enough to stop me. This one's one of the powers in the world, and he looks like a baby. Well, I held my hand there, and I can't do it. I just played with it, and oh, I shook all of you. He shook everyone up. But a lot of the world still wasn't convinced. Liston's link to the mob had people talking. The idea that the big bear would retire on the stool had people immediately suggesting a fix. It was very shocking that Liston did not come out for the seventh round. I mean, if you're heavyweight champion, you're kind of supposed to die trying. But on the other hand, he was considered a mafia fighter. He did have a contract for a return bout, which was probably for more money. Those rumors were enough for much of the public to discredit the victory. And when Clay converted to the Nation of Islam, much of the racially divided USA turned against the renamed Muhammad Ali. The rematch was set for May 25, 1965, in Boston. But the local district attorney feared organized crime was involved in the promotion and took out an injunction, prompting backers to pull out with just three weeks to go. To fulfill closed-circuit TV deals, the promoters seized on an unlikely new venue in the industrial town of Lewiston, Maine.
You've got to be in the right place at the right time. Not like these guys, the photographers who are positioned in the wrong spot to capture this flashpoint in sporting history. For the promoters of the Ali Liston rematch forced out of Boston, the right place at the right time was here, St. Dominic's Hall, the local youth center of Lewiston in May. The industrial town had never seen anything remotely like a world heavyweight title fight. Just 2,434 people paid from $25 to $100 for a seat. It's still the lowest attendance for a world heavyweight contest. If not for the stunning imagery of Ali standing above Liston, the fight might have been written off as a farce. Barely a punch was landed as Liston clumsily chased the champion for the first minute. Ali landed just three punches for the fight, but all were significant. The third became legendary. With Ali on the retreat, Liston lunged and walked straight into a short right to the head, which sent him to the canvas. It was so quick that many missed it and could not understand why Liston went down and was so slow to get up. It came to be known as the Phantom Punch amid fresh allegations that Liston took a dive. The question of, in the second fight, the so-called Phantom Punch, um, I was sitting right at ringside, and I didn't see it. But then Howard Cosell was sitting next to me, and he had a monitor, and he replayed the punch. And after the 30th time, I saw it. So, I mean, I, I, I think it was a short right hand, and it could have been perfect. Never write about me like it. It was Ali himself who first used the word phantom in an interview straight after the fight. That was my secret. It was a phantom punch, he said. It was lightning and thunder, fast as lightning and booming as thunder from the heavens. In time, the punch came to be appreciated, especially after the way Ali fooled George Foreman. But back then, there was only chaos and confusion, Sports Illustrated laying the blame on the timekeeper and the referee. There were three world heavyweight champions in the ring that night. The third was referee Jersey Joe Walcott. Walcott had twice unsuccessfully challenged Joe Lewis in the late 1940s and twice unsuccessfully challenged Ezard Charles before finally beating Charles in 1951 at his fifth bid for the belt. At 37, he became the then oldest world heavyweight champion before losing the belt to Rocky Marciano in 1952. The Rock must have shook him up a bit, because under Walcott's direction, there wasn't much sense to the way the Ali-Liston fight ended. With Ali standing over Liston, the count should not have started. Then, when Ali danced away, Walcott forgot to start the count again. Liston got to his feet, and Walcott allowed the fight to continue until Ring Magazine publisher Nat Fleischer screamed at him that the timekeeper's official count was more than 10 seconds. It was a mess. Uh, the referee, a former champion, Jersey Joe Walcott, messed up. A magazine editor, Nat Fleischer, was the one who called the time. Uh, but I, I think it really was over. I think Liston really declared emotional bankruptcy at that moment. I'm out of here. Liston maintained he had been able to continue and slammed Walcott for incompetence. Yes, I did, because I didn't hear the uh, count and no one else heard it. And when I got up and we started back to fighting, then the next thing I know, the referee was stopping the fight. We didn't know what was going on. No one else did. Walcott was never given another fight to referee. Liston was never given another title shot. He won his next 14 fights, only one of them going the distance, but none against highly rated opponents. Leotis Martin KO'd him in 1969, but only after Liston had detached Martin's retina, meaning the winner never fought again. Liston had one more fight, 
bloodying Chuck Wepner into submission in June 1970. But just over six months later, the former champion was found dead when his wife returned to their apartment from a two-week holiday over the New Year period. His body had lain undiscovered for days. The cause of death remains a mystery. Heroin overdose, natural causes, or murder. The man who never knew the date of his birth also died on an undetermined date. And despite the fearsome reputation he earned in 50 victories over 17 years, the lasting image of world champion Sonny Liston is not with his fists raised, but lying beaten at the feet of Muhammad Ali. Thanks for watching. For more great content on all the major stories in world sport, make sure you hit the subscribe button.